Welcome to United Body of Christ Church, an online ministry where it is our mission to minister and feed the Word of God to the body of Christ. Visit our website at ubcchurch.org where we offer free full-length video and audio Bible study lessons taught verse by verse. Select a speaker, topic, or series and click filter to view the Bible lesson of your choice. If you don't have a Bible, you can follow along with each verse by scrolling to the bottom of each Bible study video. If you are in need of prayer, you can visit our website and fill out the prayer request form. Please be sure to indicate if you would like your name added to our online prayer list page. And most importantly, please indicate if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. We also ask that you visit the prayer list and pray for our brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. Last but not least, the United Body of Christ app is available in the Google Play Store and your iPhone app store. Let us now join Pastor Clarence for today's Bible study lesson. God bless you, our brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, and welcome to another Bible study. Before Pastor Harden comes forth and takes us through Hosea chapters 8 and 9, let us all bow our heads and go before the Lord in prayer. Lord of heaven and earth, blessed God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God and Father, hallelujah, God and Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, King of the universe, ruler in the kingdom of men, the one who is in control of the affairs of men, whether they want to acknowledge that fact or not, hallowed be your name. Bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord of heaven and earth. Bless you, King of kings and Lord of lords. You are Alpha and Omega. You are the first and the last. We bless your holy name. You have no beginning and no end. You are King eternal. We bless you and we acknowledge you in the name of your only begotten Son, our blessed Lord and Savior, our King Jesus the glory of Israel, light to us Gentiles, the shepherd and the bishop of our souls, our high priest who intercedes for us. Thank you, Lord. Bless your name, O oh God. Bless your name, O oh God. I bless you, Holy Father. I bless you and I, we bless your only begotten Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we pray for your kingdom to come and for your will to be done in this earth as it is in heaven. We pray that it be done in all the earth. Father, we pray that righteousness would take over the nations. We pray, God, we don't pray, Lord, for calamity and destruction, but Lord, we desire your righteous kingdom. We desire the government of our Lord Jesus Christ because we know that he is righteous. We know that he does what you said do. We know that he keeps your statutes. He is the express image of your person. If we want to see you, eternal, invisible, immortal God, we look at him. And we long for him, oh God. We long for your kingdom to take over. We long for your righteousness and your holiness. We long for your statutes to be enacted in all of these nations. Father, we pray for your kingdom to come and for your will to be done. Father, we thank you for blessing us to come together and to have another Bible study today. Father, we thank you for blessing us to read in Hosea and to understand what we're reading. Lord, we pray your blessings on my husband who teaches your word. We pray your blessings, your wisdom, your instruction, and your anointing for him and for all who go forth to minister your word today. And for all who are listening, who are studying, who are reading your word, Father, we ask if you would bless that there be understanding, bless that we keep your word. We ask that you bless, Lord, that we keep your word and that we patiently, as your son said, patiently bring forth fruit for the glory of you, for the glory of your son, and then your majesty for our well-being because your word is good for us. Your statutes Teach us and lead us in the right way. And we thank you, O oh God. Father, we thank you for your mercy and your loving kindness towards us. Your majesty, we ask that you forgive us. Lord, we ask 
all who are listening, we as a body ask if you would forgive us of our sins. We thank you for long suffering and being patient with us. Your Majesty, we pray that your will be done with us. And we pray and ask if you would bless us and help us with the courage to stand for righteousness and to stand for truth. Even if that means we're going to lose loved ones or lose jobs or lose homes. Or if it even means, Your Majesty, that our lives will be lost. We know that we have eternal life with you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We pray that your will be done with this Bible study today. We pray that your will be done in each and every one of our lives. Your Majesty, help us, O oh God, that we glorify you and your Son. And we thank you. Thank you for an opportunity to study your word. Those that are your people, our brothers and sisters in Christ, that are in places where they are persecuted because they believe and confess and call on the Lord Jesus. Father, we ask you if you would protect them. We ask you if you would order their footsteps and show them where to go and what to do. We ask you, God, if you would bless them with courage, and we ask you if you would bless them that their faith does not fail. Lord, you have blessed us in some places, Lord, and in some countries you've blessed us to where we can click on a link and listen to your word, listen to a Bible study. We can have Bibles in our possessions, in our homes, and read. But then there are those, your majesty, that don't have it. And they don't complain, oh God. They bless you. They praise you. They believe on our Lord Jesus Christ no matter what's going on. They believe. They may not have a Bible they can pick up. And they only got one person that had a Bible, and they all trying to share that Bible. But they read it, they believe it, and they praise you. And God, I pray for those of us that live in places where we can easily access your word on a tablet or a telephone. We can easily access a Bible study. We can easily just walk over to our dining room table or the, the back seat of our car and pick up a Bible. But yet, oh, bless your name, oh God, bless your name. But yet we complain. We complain, oh God. We always got a problem. We always distracted. When you have made your word, you have made freedoms so readily available for us. We have no excuse and we have no reason to complain. If anything, we need to be praising you all the more so. So that when the time of destruction does come because we fall up under your judgment, when that time does come, oh God, we will have your word on the inside of us. We don't have to look back and be like, well, I remember when I could read the word because we'll have it on the inside of us. Because we will have praised you. Because we will have thanked you. Because we will have kept our faith. Help us, oh God. Help us, oh Lord, to be grateful now. To be thankful now. To absorb your word now. To praise you now. To have faith now. So that when that time comes, that evil time which we are seeing is hurtling upon us, that we can stand. Father, we thank you for your mercy and your loving kindness. We pray that your will is done with this Bible study and with us. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Have your way, O oh God. In Jesus' name, amen. My brothers and sisters in Christ, again, thank you for joining us for another Bible study. And Pastor Harden will come forth as we get into Hosea 8 and 9. God bless you. Well, God bless you, saints, citizens, and soldiers of the Most High God. My name is Clarence, and I'm pastor of United Body of Christ Church, which is our online ministry. And, be, and on behalf of my family and myself, We'd like to take this opportunity to welcome your families, to welcome yourselves back to another broadcast, back to another Bible study. Uh, today we are coming at you with Hosea chapter 8, and we should have enough time to get into Hosea chapter 9. Uh, I bless God for, for my wife, who is also my best friend and uh, my partner. Uh, that she was able to come forth, strong woman of God, that she was able to come forth and, and uh, open our Bible study up with prayer. So that, that being said, 
we'll get right into our lesson today. Very powerful lesson. I'm, I'm actually looking forward to uh, getting involved in it today. I'm, there's never a time that I'm not, you know, once you set yourself up to do those, those things that God has called you to do, you're just grateful that he uses you. Amen. Uh, God is the chef. The bread that God has prepared for all of us to break and to receive, that's that bread of life, the word of God who is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit has invited your family and yourselves, my family and, and, and myself, that we could come together during this broadcast, during this recording, uh, that we can fellowship, sup and commune, uh, feasting off the word of God here. My wife and myself, our job is to serve what God himself has prepared for all of us to receive. So to God be the glory, all credit be unto the Lord for any understanding that you and I received during this broadcast concerning the interpretation of his word. So that's our way of honoring the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Without any further ado, let's eat. Uh, for the scripture saith, man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word which proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord. So again, uh, Hosea chapter 8, beginning at verse 1. Set the trumpet to thy mouth. He shall come as an eagle against the house of the Lord, because they have transgressed my covenant and trespassed my laws. So God is saying, and God is saying, sound the alarm, because the enemy is coming, and he is going to swoop down swiftly, and he is going to attack. If you think about an eagle, when his eyes are set on a prey, he drops, he bombs out of the sky of when he's fixated on his target. He's like a missile falling from the sky, swooping down uh, to assault its target. That's the way eagles operate. And God is saying that his wrath or his judgment is coming swift as an eagle dropping from the sky. And the reason why this is happening or the reason why Israel is being attacked because Israel attacked God's covenants. They forsook his covenants, amen? And, you know, God takes it personal because Israel made a vow to the Lord. Just as God committed to Israel, Israel committed to God, amen? And, and during that time, Israel went forth and, and went a whoring after other gods or, or was called in idolatry. And Israel must have expected God to sat idly by and let Israel go and do those things that they wanted to do in the face of the Lord, Almighty God. And so God is like, nah, that, that, that's it. You know, I, I got to pull you back in. I got to do what I got to do to get you where you need to be. Amen. So very powerful, very interesting here. Israel, verse 2, Israel shall cry unto me, my God, we know thee. Have you, have you ever walked contrary to the Lord? And no matter how many dreams God has given you, no matter how many warnings, um, people, strangers will come up and try to say something to you. And, and whatever they said to you, it convicted you, you know. Eventually, something happens where the bottom of your life just drop out. Because you were heading down a wrong path and God did what he could to get your attention to warn you that nothing good can come out of that path that you're traversing. And before you know it, the bottom of life just falls out from you. And when that happens, you find yourself crying out to the Lord, Lord, please, you know, God, please help me. And the thing about it is God was warning you all that time in a dream, a TV show, something you read, something you heard to try to, turn you back because God saw what was headed your way, but you ignored and you refused. And it's commonplace that when judgment falls on us, even when it's in the form of chastisement, when it falls on us, that the very person that we have been ignoring all that time, all of a sudden, he got our attention and we're crying out to him. And that's what you see happening with Israel. Israel shall cry unto me, my God, we know thee. 
Israel has cast off that thing that is good and the enemy shall pursue him. And that's what happens with us. That the one that has blessed us, the one that has always been there for us, when we're in a state of rebellion against God, we're casting off his good thing. We're casting off his laws, his presence. Um, uh, the, the, the thing that we're supposed to give him, which is our reasonable service, it's, it's, our, it's our holiness unto the Lord. We begin to cast off all those things that please him, even God himself, even his word. We begin to cast all those things off and away. And nothing good comes of that. When you look at the state of our country, back in the day, our children uh, used to pray in school. And they cast that away. They put that away. And now what you see is those youth in which they've gone through life without that prayer because you never know. Here's the thing about it. You never know if their parents never visited the place of the Lord. So having your children to be able to pray in school may have been the only prayer that they would have gotten in life. How, you know, may have been that seed that was being planted in them to, to know that there is a, a, a good God who reigns in the heavens and, in, and on the earth. But because we've turned our children away from serving the Lord, and there is still an assault on the righteousness of Jesus today to where we're, the, the, the society is teaching our kids to be disobedient, to walk contrary in the ways of the Lord. Nothing good comes from that. And they're trying to put an impression on our children and at a young age to, to forsake the ways of God at a young age. Nothing good comes from that because society has put off that good thing. They're trying to teach our children how to never turn towards the goodness of the Lord. Nothing good comes from that. Amen? And so, as we, as we see in the Word, God doesn't sit idly by and allow it to happen. When you begin to forsake the covenant of the Lord, you're establishing an appointed time for you to be a recipient of God's wrath. And that's just the bottom line. Amen? So it says, Israel has cast off that good thing, and the enemy shall pursue him. You're no longer protected. You're, we're, we're always targeted by the enemy. But we're always protected, meaning that the enemy, there is the, all the mischief that the enemy wants to do uh, against us. He got to go through the Lord. Amen. And once God takes his hand off of you and allow the enemy to have you, that's not good. And you're going to fall towards your enemies. They set up and this is a real interesting verse here. This was eye opening. They've set up king but not by me. They've made princes, and I knew it not. For their silver and their gold have they made them idols that they may be cut off. God rules and reigns in the kingdom of men. Now, there is this thing about free will, and we're going to cover some scripture on this. And God would that when it's time for us, especially in our country, when it comes to elections, I do believe that the Lord does have a say in our elections. I, I believe that at the end of the day, God chooses whom he will to, to allow. But God still honors this free will. And look at what this says here. God looked towards Israel, but Israel never looked towards God to see what God was. God would see what Israel would do about their selections. To see, okay, we want this person to be king, that person to be uh, a prince, you know, which is a person that's in authority or a king. But Israel never sought the Lord to say, Lord, who is it that you would want to run our nation? We only looked towards the person. That, and, and nowadays, when we select a person, when we cast our ballot for a person uh, uh, to be elected and, and we want them to represent us, a lot of times we don't look to see if they have a record of walking with God. We only look to see how close they lined up with our desires. 
right? But we never see how they line up with the Lord. And God says here towards Israel, you didn't consult me when you wanted a king. And the reason why you didn't consult me, because you knew that that person, I wouldn't favor them. That's why you went and did it behind my back. You didn't want my consideration or my approval because your mind was already made up. You were going to put somebody in there, even if they didn't walk with me, but that they were favorable to your own desires and not my desire. You called them to, to the office to represent you and not represent me. And that's the problem. Let's go a little deeper in here because it talks about what the scriptures that we're about to read talks about the free will that God gives us even when it become, even when it's time for us to select our leaders. Hold your place here. And, and before we turn, I want to read this again. They have set up kings, but not by me. They didn't go through me. They have made princes, and I knew it not because they didn't consult me for consideration. Of their silver and of their gold have they made them idols that they may be cut off, that they may be killed, or it's going to cause them to be killed because they find they worship these things that they, that they made idols out of. Hold your place there, and we want to talk about this free will. Go with me to 1 Samuel chapter 8. 1 Samuel chapter 8. This is pretty interesting. I'm going to read this kind of in its entirety here. But it talks about this free will even when it comes to us selecting our leaders. 1 Samuel chapter 8, and we're going to read that chapter in whole. Look at what this says here. It came to pass, this is beginning at verse 1. 1 Samuel chapter 8, beginning at verse 1. It came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of his firstborn was jo Joel. The name of the second was Abiah. They were judges in Beersheba. Beersheba. His sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre, after, after riches. And they took bribes, and they perverted judgments. So we can see why the children of Israel wouldn't want the, the sons of Samuel uh, to be their religious leaders. We can see that, you know. Then all of Israel gathered together, gathered themselves together, and they came to Samuel unto Ramah. And they said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now, make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them. So this is, again, God honors the free will of men. Now, when God has a will that he is still trying to accomplish, he'll take into consideration your desires, but he still allow his word and his will to go forth and do those things that it's meant to, that's meant to be done. That's how that goes. But God still allows us to have a say-so about the way our lives should be, about the way governments should run. He still gives us, the, the children of Israel want to establish a, go, a government that's exclusive of the Lord and not inclusive of God. They want to establish a whole new government that has nothing to do with the Lord. And God is, is, is telling, and Samuel has an issue with it. Samuel was like, you know, y'all shouldn't be that way. And God says, no, don't be angry at them. This is not about you. This is about me. Okay, so God is honoring this. Look, look at this. Let's continue to read here. So the Lord said unto Samuel, hearken, we read that, verse 8, according to all the works which they have done since the day that I've brought them out of Egypt, even unto this day, wherewith they have forsaken me and they served other gods, so, so do they also unto thee. Now therefore, 
hearken unto their voice. It's about their will. Hearken unto their voice. How be it, yet protest solemnly unto them, and show them the manner of the king, thou shalt reign over them. Here is what's so powerful. God says, okay, I'm going to allow them to set up their government and choose who they want to, to have authority within this government. But before you do that, before make sure that you let them know what the expectation is of the man that they choose before me. Because they're replacing God with man. They said, we don't want you to lead and guide us. We want a king like all the other nations. So God says, tell them about the character of a king. And let them know, let them see. Because I, I would have them that they be not ignorant of putting their trust in man and not in God. I would, I would that you be not ignorant. Okay, Even though you got this card that you use and this free will card. I would that you be not ignorant about the character of this king. So look at what the Lord says. Now therefore hearken unto their voices. In verse 10, Samuel told all the people of the words of the Lord, uh, or Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people that asked him for a king. And he said, this will be the manner, or this is the character of the king that shall reign over you. This is what you can expect of him. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself. God didn't do that in that manner. And appoint them for some and for his chariots to be his horsemen. And some shall run before his chariots. He will appoint him captains over thousands, captains over fifties, and will set them to air his ground, to reap his harvest, to make his instruments of war, and instruments of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be his, conf his confectionaries and to be his cooks, to be his bakers. He will take your fields and your vineyards, your olive, your olive yards, even the best of them, and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your sea and of your vineyards and give them to his officers and to his servants. And he will take your men servants and your maid servants and your goodliest young men and your donkeys or your asses and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your sheep and, and ye shall be his servants. And you shall cry out in that day because of your king which ye shall have chosen, which ye have chosen you, and the Lord would not hear you in that day. So we wanted to read what happens here. And let me finish this up here. We're going to read this in its entirety. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, Nay, but we will have a king over us. That we, also, that we also may be like all the nations that our king may judge us and will go out before us and go out before us and fight our battles. Samuel heard all the words of the people and rehearsed them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, hearken unto their voice and make them a king. And Samuel said unto the men of Israel, go ye out every man unto his city. So God respects the will of the people. And if the will, if the people want to have a king, God is going to allow them to cast their ballot, to cast their vote, or to, or to bring forth their opinion on the matter. And God will do what he can to facilitate the desires that even if you're replacing him, he'll allow you to do so. It's about free will. Now, when it comes to those things that God wants to render according to his kingdom, according to his will, it doesn't matter who we select. If God is trying to do something or establish something or bring forth, bring forth something or tear something down, God will use our choices and our decisions to bring forth his word, his promises and his will. So that's how that works. That's the understanding of how that works. 
It's best that our desires line up with the will of God. But oftentimes, we don't consult God. We'll compromise. And, 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 and we'll look at, Lord, we'll, look, we'll say to one another, um, I remember years ago, my wife and I, when we were trying to find a home, we were in the market to buy a home. So this is about 13, 14 years ago, we were in the market to buy a home. And the realtor that we were working with told us to make a list of things that we can live with and things that we don't want to live without so that we can, uh, those most important things that we want to have and those things that we can do without. And I, I'm, I'll bring that forth to say that when it comes to selecting in our own nation in modern times, um, we look at our presidents and our, our other elected officials. If you were to make or compose a list of how that person needs to be and what you can live with as far as electing them and what you can't live with as far as making sure that they don't represent you, at the top of that list, will God have anything to do with it? Because a lot of times, nowadays, when people decide, okay, I want that person to be my president, they're not looking at if that person is about you know, abortion, how, what their views are about abortion. We're just, a lot of times, we're voting for someone in an effort to vote against somebody else. We, if we don't like the person that's, that, that, that currently had that office, it don't matter what the other person's views are. Just as long as the one that we can't stand don't get on up in there. Even if the person that we're voting for in the effort to vote against somebody else, even if we believe that they're not totally walking with God. And, and, and to be honest with you, the other person that may have been in office may not walk with God. But we don't look at, we look at a person's actions because we know that there are people that are in the Bible that we read about that didn't walk with God. But they always had someone under them who did walk with God. You know, that's that they were favorable to the children of God, to the ch to the children of Israel, because they, they even though they didn't serve the children of Israel, God, they were still mindful of them. So they allow, you know, certain people to be in position. Your voice. Ha your, when it comes to our elected officials. We have to choose people that lines up with 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 the word of the Lord, otherwise these leaders, <coughs> these leaders will show you more than they can tell you, you know, about how they feel about the Lord. And before you know it, your nation is headed in the wrong direction. And a lot of that had to do with, the, with, with what you were willing to compromise on. And God was nowhere on your list. You know, how do they feel about, about life or how do they feel about religious matters, about how do they feel about these things. And their track record shows you, you know, maybe they're the kind of people, the elected official, maybe they'll give you a hand up. But when it comes to those Christian values, you don't see that in their walk. But they were willing to, you know, uh, we'll, we'll make it so that you can get this for free or you can get that for free or we'll give you this level of protection. Or, but then once they get in office, you don't see that. If they don't commit to the Lord, what make you think they're going to actually follow through and commit to you? That's why we can't. That's why when we read these things in Scripture, it's written for our understanding. God takes issue when we profess to be his children but then the leaders that we that we seek to, re, to you know to represent us, we don't even consider if they actually really walk with God, and we don't look at what somebody say. We look at what their walk is like, what their history is like. So, even if you don't like a person, if you're going to compose a list of of all the people that are running for office. And you're going to put down what you can live with and what you can't live with. The first thing on that list is you got to see is what are their views on this inf on this particular issue? Is it is it a Christian view or is it not a Christian view? Because you're going to be judged accordingly for that, too. Look at what this says. They're going to this. Look at what this says. They've set up kings 
but not by me. They have made princes, and I knew it not. They didn't, they didn't seek me for consideration concerning those who they were looking to represent them. God takes issue with that, and that's all you have to know. God takes issue when we don't consult him about who it is we want to represent us, who is the, the king or who is the prince or who is the judge, who is the school board member or who is the, who is the, 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 the state's attorney general. When we don't consult him or we don't add him in to, to our decision, meaning that we should be looking at who it is and, and how they walk with God. How have they voted? Even if they don't walk with God, let me see what they what kind of legislation that they put forth. Let me see what their voting record was like. Have they voted on those things concerning the kingdom of God going forward? Or have their vote really been against the kingdom of God? That's how we have to look. Those are the things that we have to look for. And if you're putting someone in office who has legislation, they may have helped the common man, but when it came to the values of the kingdom of God, they totally turned their back and also put legislation against the kingdom. That's an issue. So I look at these things being written for a reason. So I'll, I'll continue to move on here. Verse 5. Thy calf, and I look at this as in thy golden calf, O Samaria, has cast thee off. My anger is kindled against them. And how long will it, how long will it be uh, ere they attend to innocency? So God is saying, look at this golden calf. And then the capital of Israel is Samaria. Look at this golden calf that's set up in Samaria. Okay? And it, and it says, has cast thee off. My anger is kindled against them. You've put me away for this golden calf that you're looking at as some kind of God. Hmm? And you got this set up in the capital. This is what you this is what you're worshiping. Incidentally, when we look at our stock market, you'll have two fixtures that represent uh, uh, the progress of the market. You'll hear the term a bull market meaning that the market is, is it's, a good, it's a good opportunity to buy. It's being prosperous. You'll also hear the bear market, meaning that, man, it's rough out there. We, it's, it's hard to make a profit right now. Incidentally, that term, the bull market, comes from this golden calf. It's, it's, it's real powerful because this golden calf is what they look at towards prosperity. And, and we've adopted that even to this day when it comes to our stock market, this is again, this is when you hear the term a bull, the, the, the market, a bull market or a bear market, right? Now, it, it goes far beyond what was happening in Samaria. Let's reread verse 5. Thy calf, or in its, in, in its proper context, if it's translated correctly, it says, The golden calf, O Samaria, has cast thee off. Mine anger is kindled. I'm angry at them because they've placed us there. And then it says, why can't you just walk uh, uh, in, in, in righteousness? Why is it hard for you to walk in innocency? Why are you always victimizing? Why can't you walk upright? And, 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 and I have to lower the bar of expectation that you will ever uh, 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 obtain unto innocency. That's what the Lord is saying here. I'm looking down the road and I can't see that you're going to ever be upright before me. But hold your place there. Let's talk a little bit about this golden calf. Uh, go with me. Let's go back into the archives. Go with me into Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32 and let's read verses 1 through 6. Exodus chapter 32 verses 1 through 6. And look at what this is. This is about the golden calf. This is why we call it the golden calf. And when the people saw, beginning at verse 1, when the people saw Moses delayed to come down out of the mountain, Moses was in the mountain with the Most High God, and he left Aaron in charge. Okay, He left Aaron in charge while Moses was on the mountaintop, and he didn't come down anytime soon. He was up there for like some 40 days. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mountain, the people gathered, gathered themselves together unto Aaron. Aaron was the one left in charge. He said unto him, go up, make us, they, they said unto him, up, make us gods which shall go before us. 
For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we won't not what has become of him. We don't know what's happened to Moses. So Aaron, we need you to make us God, to make us an idol that we can worship because we don't know what's happened to Moses. We don't even know if he's coming back. Okay. Aaron said unto them, break off the golden earring. This is how you get this golden calf. Break off the golden earrings, which are in the ears of your wives and of your sons and of your daughters and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings, which were in their ears, and they brought them unto Aaron. He received them at their hand and he fashioned it with graving tools. And after he made it a molten calf, and after, I'm sorry, after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is the feast to the Lord. And they rose up early tomorrow, and they offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat, to drink, and they rose up to play. So they, when the scripture says they rose up to play, they, they got involved in, in a religious freak fest, if you will. They, they began to, uh, um, that rose up to play. They were involved in re, uh, uh, ritual orgies, sex, sex acts is what was happening there. But look at, what, look at the tone that was set. The, the, the man of God that was, that was there to oversee them during Moses' absence the papal sought him out and was like, look, you know, Moses ain't coming back. We don't know if he's going to ever come back. He's not here. We don't know if he's coming back. We need something that, that we can look upon for worship. And they end up taking all the earrings out of the people's ears. All those people, there's the wives, the sons, the daughters. They took these golden earrings and they melted them down. And once they melted it down, they formed what was this golden calf because these were golden earrings. So where did Israel learn to do this? Well, they learned, they picked this up back in Egypt. And over the course of time, it carried this, this, this tradition, this ritual, this idol carried forth uh, throughout, the, throughout the days, throughout the decades, throughout the, the, the centuries. And God calls them out on it yet. Back in Hosea, God calls them out on it. In verse 5, thy golden calf, O Samaria, has thee cast off. Mine anger is against them. You know, and he says, How long will you err? How long will it be that ye err that they that they attend unto innocency? When will you ever walk in righteousness? When will that time ever be? You're too busy worshiping this golden calf in, this, in, in your nation's capital. In our nation's capital, we have, a, um, I believe they call it the Washington Monument. Um, that's what the modern name of it is, but that's not exactly what it is. You have to look it up to say what it is, but it's, that was created in idolatry. That whole tower that rises up in our nation's capital, we, for, for, uh, for family's sakes, for, for value's sake, family value's sake, we'll call it the Washington Monument. But that is not what it was erected to be. It was, it was more, uh, you know, it was more diabolical than that. And when we watched, if there's, if people are watching TV shows, uh, like FBI or something like that. Every time they show Washington, they'll show that monument that stands up there. Uh, and again, that's not, we know it as the Washington Monument, but that's the PG version of that. <laughs> there is a rated R version of that in which it was actually created and known as today in, in the occult. It's known as something else because that is in regards to what it was created for in the first place. It represents something that's no good. Amen. And the, it has this meaning and this detail in the occult. Okay. And that's what God is calling out in the, in the capital of Israel. They got a golden calf that they're worshiping. In our nation's capital, we have this monument there 
and and it has meaning in 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 occult mysticism and 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 in, in pagan worship it's no good when we see these things that are written we have to look at this and see how it applies to us and we're supposed to be better than that we're supposed to attend unto innocency we're supposed to attend unto righteousness but our deeds and our acts the, the legislations that come out of our state capital is far from our walk with the Lord. As a matter of fact, when, when, when our legislatures put forth bills, the bills are contrary to our, to our walk with the Most High God. And they're not the only ones responsible. It's because we put them there, you know, and it's no good. It is no good. And as a nation, we have to return back and to, to me, as God is looking at the children of Israel and saying, when will you ever return back to innocence? When will you ever get to a place of innocency? I kind of see that in, in, in itself concerning our nation. And I don't see our nation ever going to the Lord our God. I can't say going back. I don't know if our nation was ever there. But I don't see it reversing course. It's moving full speed ahead in the opposite direction of, of God. So therefore, individually, we have to see where our nation is going based on what the scripture says. We have the example to see how Israel drifted away. And so we look at our own nation and we say, do the values of our nation equates to us moving into the arms of God or moving closer to his wrath? Is, is, is our ways moving closer to the arms and the heart of God or moving closer to his wrath? And that's what we have to look at. For our parts individually, it helps if we can consult God concerning who it is we want to represent us in our state capital. You know, that's always a help. Amen. So this is pretty interesting here. So we, we read verse five, verse six, for Israel was it also the workmen made it. So from, for, I'm sorry, verse six, for from Israel was it also the workmen made it. Therefore, it is not God. But the calf of Samaria shall be broken into pieces. Israel sought to it that it, it that this calf would be erected there in Samaria. And because that is not of the Lord, that is not representative of God. We don't we don't represent God with images. We don't represent God with crucifixes, with church steeples, anything that has to do with image to represent who our faith or our walk with God. God is not representative of any images in the heaven above, on, on, on the land of the earth, or in the, or in the seas. There is nothing that we are to take to represent who God is. And, and the children of Israel say, and here's the problem with that. You can, you can try to say, well, this rock, I'm going to shape this rock into what I believe God is like. And then I'm going to use this to worship. Well, that rock ain't going to save you. <laughs> that rock is not the what's bringing you salvation. Do you understand that? God does not. And it's easy for someone else to come and contradict what that meaning is and, and redirect another meaning to it. That's why God don't want to be represented, represented by representative of, of any images in the heavens above and the earth below or in the heavens beneath or, or in the oceans rather beneath. Amen. So we have to, our walk has to be pure with the Lord, our God. Amen. So it says Israel was the one that saw to it in verse seven, that they would have this idol and that they would worship it. And God is saying that I see it and I'm telling you, my plans is to destroy it and to destroy you with it because of what you've done, because you the one that saw to it. He says, for they've sown to the wind and they shall reap the whirlwind. It hath no stalk, the bud shall yield no meal. It's, if so it be yield, the stranger shall swallow it up. God's talk, God is talking about his judgment here. Look at what he says here. You plant a wind and you're going to get a hurricane. It talks about his judgment there. It, that, it's very profound here. You plant the wind or you sow the wind. Because you're sowing towards it, you're going to get exactly what you put into it. If, if, if you didn't put in on peace, but you put in to, on calamity, you're going to get war. That's the harvest of, of the seeds that you sown. 
If you've turned your back on God, nothing good comes from that. The very, God is the one that gives you peace and prosperity, righteousness, uprightness, holiness. Uh, um, he gives you wealth and, and longevity. You know, God is the one that allow those things to come to pass. If you turn your back on him and you put in on destruction, you're going to get calamity. And that's what God is saying. You, whatever you sown, that's what you're going to reap. If you were sowing towards the wind, then you're going to get a hurricane. If you were sown, sowing towards calamity, you're going to receive destruction. And if so that you would get a harvest, God is saying, I'm going to see to it that you don't even get a chance to take of the fruit of your harvest. I'm going to see to it that, a, that, a, that the stranger get a chance to partake of the harvest that you work hard to plant. So if you, had, if you have wine, grape vines, and you were trying to get the grapes so that you can get wine, if you was trying to uh, raise up stalks of, of, of corn or grain so that you can get your meals, I'm going to see to it that whatever you planted, even if that would come to pass and you would get a harvest, you wouldn't enjoy the harvest, but that a stranger would be able to take over your harvest and you won't get that. But concerning you turning your back, you reap what you sow. If you turn away from God, then you're turning away from his protections. You're turning away from his prosperity and from his peace, and you're going to get calamity. Amen. And that's what that verse is saying there. Real heavy. This is written for a reason. Israel is swallowed up. Now shall they be among the Gentiles as a vessel wherein there is no pleasure. They're not, by the time God you get his wrath fall on them and, and, and put them away, they'll be living in the midst of the Gentiles. They'll be displaced, worn out, and damaged goods from the wrath of the Lord. Amen. For they are going up to Assyria, a wild ass alone by himself. Ephraim should be hired lovers. They're trying to, Israel is going to seek to go up and make peace deals with, with various allies, including the Assyrians who are going to be the ones to be the executor of God's wrath. The Assyrians don't know that God is the one sending them in there. They think that they're coming against Israel on, on their own expedition, uh, you know, on their own ambitions. But that feeling that they have to conquer Israel, to conquer Israel is actually coming from God. Amen. And so Israel tries to preempt this, this wrath of God against them through the Assyrians by going and trying to come up with some form of a peace treaty well, with the Assyrians to try to become an ally and you know with with uh, with the uh, with the Assyrians but it's not going to help for they've gone up to Assyria a wild ass alone by himself no cart attached to it you know Ephraim hath hired lovers or becomes uh, Israel is going to try to engage with allies okay yea though they've hired among the nations now will I gather them and they shall sorrow a little for the burdens of the kings of the princes you hear, people always think that the more you hear this term, the more the merrier. So if everybody is is for something, then people, even if it's against God, but because the whole earth is for it, that God won't destroy the earth because everybody is in agreement. So, but it don't work like that. God is saying that even if Israel go and ally with all of these nations, I'm still going to single Israel out and, and, and you know, chastise Israel for what they've done. It don't matter how many nations they've allied with. When God's wrath come, you can ally yourself or, or join yourself with the greatest superpower that man has ever known. You know, weapons of mass destruction, a huge navy, a huge army, uh, air force that 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 pales in comparison uh, air force who's no one else will ever be able to match but when God singles you out no one and nothing can prevent what's coming when when God has targeted you there is no one and nothing that can deliver you from the hands of God when he, when he's ready to get a hold of you it don't matter who you ally yourself with and that's the problem Unless the, the best thing you can do for yourself is to repent 
to turn from your wicked ways, to humble yourself and call on the Lord. That's, that's the bottom line. You can, and, and Israel don't do that. And instead, they decide to ally with the enemy, you know, as though that they're going to find protection from the Lord. And this is written for a reason. When we've been walking in rebellion of the Lord, what brings us what 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 brings us back to the Lord is when we begin to humble ourselves and repent and turn from our wicked ways. Amen. Now it's not to say that God God is not going to chastise us, but maybe it won't be so long and maybe it won't be so hard if we humble ourselves, if we turn from our wicked ways. But Israel didn't turn to God. It turned to other nations, you know, and that's the problem. And and because of what what its leaders have done, how the leaders become a stumbling block and Israel followed after that. They're going to fall. Look at what it says here. Yea, though they've hired or they've allied among the nations, now will I gather them and they shall sorrow a little for the burden of the kings of the princes because of what their leaders have done and provoked Israel to do. You know, I'm going to come after them. You know, and, and, and they're going to have to pay the price. So we have to be mindful about who we have to represent us and then following them. And like I said, we can't be petty and say, I'm going to put you in office because I, I don't like even though you don't walk according to the ways of the Lord. I got a problem with the person that is in there. And I much rather see you, you know, even on your own walk, but I much rather see you than see that person. And if if there is no one that walks with the Lord for me to choose to, to maintain that I just won't cast my vote. And people are people are trying to guilt trip you and say, hey, that 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 you know, we have we've had people that died for you to have the opportunity to cast your vote. But if no one is walking with the Lord, why would I want to cast my vote? Why would I want to vote for somebody? So God could be like, why would you vote against me by voting for that person? They put forth legislation against me. Why would you do that? You know, they they they, they saw to it that that Israel would, would 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 you know that nations would come against Israel. They they saw to it that as I blessed man to bring to be fruitful and to multiply, they did what they could to to stop men from multiplying through abortion. You know, why would you do that? Why would you vote for somebody that's in favor of those things? You know, and instead of people, you know, why why would you do that? So we have to be mindful of that. Amen. Yea, though they've hired among the nations, now will I gather them, and they they shall sorrow a little for the burdens of the kings of the princes, because Ephraim has made, oh my goodness, look at this verse, folks, because Ephraim has made many altars to sin, altars shall be unto him to sin. Let me help you to understand this verse here. Let me give you a verse just hit me and this will help you understand it go with me to the gospel of john chapter four the gospel of john chapter four the gospel of john chapter four the samaritan woman at the well let's start at verse one holy ghost give me this gave me this understanding here look at this when therefore the lord knew how the pharisees had heard that jesus had made and baptized more disciples than john then Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples. He left Judea and he departed uh, again into Galilee. He must needs to go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Uh, Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, he sat thus on the well. And it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy food or to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which is a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, who it is that said to thee, Give me to drink, thou would have asked of him, and he would have given thee living waters. The woman saith unto him, Sir, 
thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence thou hast that living water? You're saying that if I knew who it was that I was really talking to, I would be asking you for living waters. The problem is I don't see to it that you have any label or anything in your hand that can reach down there and pour water out of this well. How is it that you're going to offer me water when you have nothing to use to draw the water from? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself and the children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water, I th give me this water that I thirst not neither come hither to draw. Jesus says unto her, and this is what we want to see, this is why we're over here. Go, call thy husband, and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus says unto her, thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou hast now is not thy husband, and that thou, tru thou hast truly said. Now, go, go back up here to verse 12 and look at what, what the woman says. Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us this will and drink thereof um, himself and the children and his cattle? We look at sacred things and try to go to those things that are sacred and, and look at them for help and holiness. Okay? We'll look at those sacred things and, and, and look at them as help in holiness. But those very things that we look at for help, help allows us to get turned out, to be defiled. You can go to places of worship that may not um, have the holiness that you're looking for, but it may have camaraderie. But there may be people in that whole place that that may be allowed to do what they want to do and will turn you out if you're not careful. Do you understand that? So when we go back into the scripture here in Hosea, it says, but Ephraim had in verse 11, Ephraim has many altars to sin. Altars shall be unto him to sin. A lot of times we'll go, we'll, we'll take part in something because we look at it as being religious or holy and we think it's going to help us keep this, this kind of uh, circumspective walk to, to try to be holy in our walk. And our engagement in that makes turns us out and make us worse than the person that we were. Do you see what I'm saying? In this case, Israel set up all these altars. And these altars was used to atone for their sin. Now all of these, now all of these altars set up at all of these places. Now Israel go there for 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 idolatry. Now what was once used to help them to walk upright is now used to help them to to be unrighteous in idolatry. We have to be careful. The woman at the well was going to this well, and she talked about how sacred it was that Jacob. Had given her, had given her ancestors that well. But when you look at her life, nothing was changed for the better in her life. If anything, her life was worse and not better. She had five husbands and was working on number six. Do you understand what I'm saying? We look sometime at these at, at, at these sacred things and we deem them to be holy and that they're going to help us to be this kind of person. But our engagement of that continually, we begin to to be exploited by certain things and before you know it we're turned out we're worse than what we were before we found that that's why we have to be careful about what we avail ourselves to yeah this is why you hear me say time and time again well now we streamline our recordings but in our in our <coughs> past broadcast we would always say don't have the pastor's relationship with god amen God had already set up, you got to think about it. 
the problem that God had with the Pharisees, the problem that Jesus had with the Pharisees. They were religious leaders, supposedly religious leaders, but they turned the people out and made the people worse than what they were. And Jesus called them out on it. Their brand of religions defiled the people and turned them out. The people looked at the Pharisees as being holy and sacred. They did this, you know, just, but these guys were far from it. And the people were turned out by the acts and the deeds of the Pharisees. God, man has tried religion through other men. And it's never worked through people, places, and things. And it never worked. Jesus didn't come to establish religion. He came to establish relationship. Your holiness, the holiness that you seek is never at that place that you that you deem to be so sacred and holy. It's through the Holy Ghost that abides in you that God gives you the strength to be upright through Jesus Christ. Not that temple that you go to, not that not that altar not that song, not that preacher, not that pastor, not that bishop. But it's your obedience through God. It's your obedience to God through his Holy Ghost and by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So then when you listen to our messages and, and, and other messengers of God, you're not looking at them. You're hearing what they have to say and applying that to your walk. A lot of times we're looking at these things and we're looking for the wrong thing and we get turned out. And that's what scripture is saying here because e Ephraim, and it's talking about Israel, has made many altars to atone for the sin. Altars shall be unto him sin, meaning that all of these altars that were set up to help you in your walk to be holy, to, to not sin. You got so defiled that now all of these sacred places that you set up, you're going in, you're going to all of these places for idolatry, to practice uh, 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 I idolatry. And that's no good. And that's what the Lord is saying. So that's real powerful there. So hopefully you have an understanding of that. Very powerful. I've written to him the great things of my law, but they were counted to him a strange thing. That's where our nation is. When it comes to... The, 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 the laws of God or when it comes to the word of God that we read, especially our New Testament, our nation, when it, our nation don't want to have anything to do with it. When it comes to Congress or Senate con convening or, you know, joint coming together for meetings, they don't want to open up with the pledge of lead, the pledge of allegiance or any, they don't want to open up in prayer to represent our Christian faith. Our nations were supposedly founded on Christian values, Christian principles. But nowadays, it's a strange thing to our nation. Our youth of today, they don't care to know. They don't want to know anything that contradicts what their beliefs are concerning the way they are to live their life. They don't want to know that. And, and, and our elected leaders, our elected leaders, rather, are, are in the balance of that, making sure that they give the people what they want. The people don't want a relationship with God, so legislation is going to come forth that, put, that puts people more and more out of sight of God. Hmm? We're going to we're keep electing leaders that that going to see to it that nobody prays in public. If anything, that that to confuse you about who you pray, you, you pray to Muhammad or, or you know, pray to Buddha or pray, I don't know who they want you to pray to now. But none of them don't want to mention the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's no good. It's just no good. Our leaders are, are representative, representative of our beliefs today as we put them in office to continue on in our in our likes and in our and why we put them there in the first place. And so that's look at that's what that is saying there. I've written to him the great things of my laws. My word, my laws were there to bless you. It was to warn you, to to tell you don't head in that direction. Do this and you'll prosper. 
but they would do they would have nothing to do with it that's what verses tw verse 12 is saying they won't have anything to do with my with my ways or my word and then and, and we see that as a nation they sacrifice flesh for the sacrifices of mine offering and they eat it but the lord accepted them not now will he remember their iniquity and visit their sins and they shall return to egypt now God, it's amazing because God gives you an opportunity to repent, to turn your life around, to humble yourself, to seek his face, to, to, to let his counsel be established in your life. He gives you every opportunity to do so. He is a gracious and a merciful God. But whoa, man, there's something else when God remembers your sin and then come after you for it. That's something that's just, that's a hard cold-blooded thing right there amen and so that's what god is saying here and then look at what it's saying they shall return to egypt meaning that remember when when the children of israel lived when they were uh, in bondage or in captivity in egypt they were slaves in egypt god is saying that they're going to return when the assyrians take them they're going to be as though they were in Egypt. They're going to return to being in, in captivity. So that's being metaphoric there. Amen. For Israel has forgotten his maker and built it temples or palaces. Judah has multiplied fin cities, but I will send a fire upon his cities and it shall devour the palaces thereof. Um, we're trying to build cities and towns and have municipalities and for, you know, build the tallest, the tallest buildings um, to, you know, to show what we can do, you know, have the greatest military with the biggest armies and think that nothing can, can touch us. But boy, when God set his sights on you because you turned your back against him, nothing that you've done cannot be touched. Not, you can't, it won't be protected. If anything, it will be targeted to let you know that it can't stand. Remember when they built the Titanic and they said that it, not even God can sink this ship. And what happened? It, it sank. It's, it's unfortunate. What happened? It sank. Unfortunately, many, many lives were lost on that. And that's an unfortunate thing. It sank. And that's what happens building these fence cities and fortified cities it's your pride that you don't need god who gave you the ability to build it in the first place you're saying you don't need him amen so that's going to take care of chapter uh eight and let's go right into chapter nine and we'll try to get through it pretty quick here uh and we actually have a theme for chapter nine the days of visitation has come the days of visitation uh, actually, the days of visitation are come. The days of visitation are come. So Hosea chapter 9, verse 1. Rejoice not, O Israel, for joy as other people. For thou hast gone a whoring from, from thy God. Thou hast loved a reward upon every uh, corn floor. So he says, rejoice, O Israel. He said, rejoice not, O Israel, for, for joy as other people. And when, you, I, when I did the research on that, they used to have these... Um, uh, festivals, these harvest fest festivals that multiple nations would 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 uh, would observe, and during that time, these harvest festivals were you know because they they thank their idols for uh, the harvest that would come, you know the grain harvest, the the grapes, what have you that that would come forth, and they would attribute the the prosperity of that to their false gods and and in those in those festivals because there was, were gentiles or pagans that were involved in that of course there were come these sexual rituals and various things of the sort god is calling israel out don't be like them and do that you know uh you know don't 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 be don't be like them you rejoice not O israel for joy as other people for thou hast gone a horn uh, from thy God. They're dedicated to their God. Don't don't come at me and, and act like I'm the one that gave you these. Even though I did, you don't acknowledge that concerning me. You know, so don't be rejoicing. And that's the thing about these other nations, these these pagan nations. 
they were loyal about the idols that they served. And they looked at those idols as this, it was because of your blessing that we've got these, that we've got this harvest. So God is saying, uh-uh, don't come at me and think that, you know, try to be like them to say that, you know, you're going to thank me for what I gave you because you don't attribute it to me. Your, your harvest that you've gotten now, you don't attribute that. You don't attribute that to me. You attribute that to other gods. So don't be like them. I'm not taking that, right? Verse two. And then this, this word here in verse one, corn floor, is talking about the threshing floor. You've gone a whoring from thy God. Thou hast loved the reward upon every, you're always in these uh, threshing floors, uh, places where they're processing the grain. You're always in there. And even in those places, you're, you're prostituting yourself into idolatry. It says the threshing floor in verse two, and the wine press shall not feed them and the new wine shall fail in her. So though you got this threshing floor, where, again, where they process the grains and stuff, and then you have your, 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 your grape vines where you have the wine press from the grapes to make the wine, that's going to fail you. Because you failed me, these things are going to fail you. Okay? They shall not dwell in the Lord's land, but Ephraim shall return to Egypt. Remember, they're going to re go in back into captivity through the Assyrians, and they shall eat unclean things in Assyria. <coughs> Israel, especially when we look at the laws of Moses and, and the things that Israel was supposed to eat and what they were not supposed to eat, they're not going to have a choice in the matter once they're held in, in captivity in Assyria. Look at what that says here. They shall not dwell in the Lord's land, but Ephraim shall return to Egypt, and they shall eat unclean things in Assyria. They shall not offer wine offerings to the Lord, neither shall they be pleasing unto him. Their sacrifices shall be unto them as bread of mourners. All that eat, th that eat thereof shall be polluted or shall be defiled, for their bread, for their souls shall not come into the house of the Lord." It reminds me of the good old days. I, I can reminisce. I remember when I was young, I, I, living with my grandparents, my granddad at that time, he was a smoker. He would smoke cigarettes. But he would often give me a dollar and 25, uh, one dollar and a quarter. And he would have me to go to the corner store. And my granddad would have me, every day that I would come home from school, he, oh, mostly every day, he would send me to go get a pack of Marlboros and, and a newspaper, and a dollar twenty-five covered that bill. And my childhood during that time, as I had gotten older and I began to drive, I remember seventy-five cent a gallon was the cost to put fuel in my car. And I'm forty-nine, so that's that's how old I am. I'm forty-nine. But I remember growing up in South Bend, Indiana, uh, gas prices being 75 cents a gallon, 75 cents a gallon. I'm bringing all of this up to say that these are the things that you reminisce about. These are the things that you remember and you think how life was at that time. You know, and of course, you try not to think of anything negative when you reminisce. You always look at what was good and how good you had it. I lived at my grandparents' house and I didn't realize how good I had it when I didn't have to pay bills, you know. And uh, I ate every day. My clothes was always washed. I didn't have to worry, just didn't have a worry. My grandparents took care of me. Those were the good old days. Well, that relates to what we're reading about. When you're in captivity, you're going to reminisce about how good you had it when you were in the land of Israel. When you were in the land of Canaan, you're going to reminisce about how well you had it, how, how bountiful the supplies were, how you were able to not take in any unclean things, and you were able to keep that, you know, and, and to observe that. Now you're finding yourself in a situation to where you have no choice in the matter, and you're going to always feel unclean. Because what you've kept yourself away from, you now can't get rid of. And it has defiled you. You're left to just reminisce about how good you once had it. 
That's the thing about it. That's what you see. And <laughs> our nation is experiencing the same thing. We're going to look back at how good we once had it. And man is still trying to preserve the legacy of some things. I was watching college football yesterday. And I watched all the people in the stadium, in the in the stadiums, and 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 how close the people were. And I was like, "Wow, look at that!" You know, and men are men is trying to hold on to the former years where I think that things are going to be a memory, to where you're going to continue to live with this 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 virus. And it's going to always be uh, different forms of it. And it's going to seemingly always come against your lifestyle. And it don't matter what kind of vaccinations you get. It's going to keep transforming to where these things are going to be distant memories down the road to, to the way things used to be. You know, um, how good you had it to where you can go into a movie theater and you can go into a restaurant. It's weird to go into a movie. Uh, to I haven't been to the theater. My family or myself have not been to a theater in quite some time now. But to go into restaurants and not see people with masks on their faces, to see people walking down the street with masks on, or to see people driving in their vehicles with masks on, or to constantly uh, have uh, uh, COVID things. You're, to, to some, some states have it to where you have to show that you've been vaccinated in order to partake in society. That's going to be a way of life to where we look at these things and reminisce and think about how we once had life, how life once had us and how good it was. And, and even though there were some negative things about life, I would prefer those days than the days that we have now. Israel is going to get that uh, as we're reading this. We're, we're reading this and, and God is saying, imagine being at this in, in, in bondage and in captivity in Assyria and those things that you just at liberty, you had the liberty to, to turn, to, uh -uh, I'm not eating that, that's, I'm, that, that stuff would defile me. That would defile me. That's, I, I can't eat that when, when, when I'm going through this. Those ceremonial things that you observed uh, in Israel, in, in Canaan, is going to be a fleeting memory. Now you have to practice and participate in your enemy's ritual. Those things that defiled you, you're, you're, you have to live according to that constant. Those days are long gone. And that's what we look at. That's, that's what really stands out here. Look at verse five. What will you do in the in the appointed days or in the solemn days, in the days of the feast days? Remember how you were. Remember how you are currently in your feast days. But when you go into captivity, what will you do when your feast days come? All you can do is look back at how you used to assemble and how you used to observe your 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 holy days and, and your solemn assemblies. Those were going to be fleeting memories of yours for lo they are gone because of destruction see that's that how you look back those days are now gone because of destruction egypt shall gather them up memphis shall bury them the pleasant places for their silver their weeds weeds shall possess them and thorns that were nestles weeds shall possess them and thorns shall be in their tabernacle if they if they should somehow escape the Assyrians, they're going to have to deal with the Egyptians. They're going to have to deal with Memphis, you know. So no matter what, no matter which direction they turn, they won't be able to escape the wrath and the judgment of the Lord. All those things that they held sacred, those things that are that are of value, the pleasant places for their silver, nestles shall be, you know, weeds shall possess them, and thorns uh, shall be in their tabernacles. If you're not there uh, to, to uh, uh, we have a house currently on our street to where there's vines that are starting to cover this house. And when, if it's not been, if there's not a caretaker that can, um, that can add maintenance to that 
property, then what happens is thorns and, and vines begin to cover it. Amen. And, and God is saying that because you are not going to be there in, 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 in Canaan, but you are going to be taken away into Assyria. Those areas of yours that you would have had, those precious places are going to be uh, covered up in, 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 in weeds and various things because there won't be anybody there for caretaking. Amen. The days of the visitation are come. The days of recompense are come. Israel shall know it. The prophet is a fool. The spiritual man is mad for the magnitude of their iniquity and the great hatred. The days of the visitation are come. How long as a nation do we think that if judgment begins at the house of the Lord and other nations recognized us, at, at least some point in our walk, they believed that we were a Christian nation with Christian values. So they attributed us to being a worshipers of Jesus Christ. At what point in time or how long do you think you can walk contrary to the word of God? If judgment starts at the house of God, how long do you think it's going to be before the day of visitation shall come upon us? If judgment starts at the house of the Lord, meaning that God is going, before he dispenses his judgment against the unbelievers, he is going to chastise the believers for their rebellion. It's going to happen to us first. Uh, how long do you think you'll be able to, to, to keep going in rebellion against God before he take action against you? It's going to come. And that's the thing about it. Judgment is coming. It's not, as men say, it's not a question of if, but when. And it says here, judgment comes because Israel didn't take seriously the prophet. Israel looked at the prophet as a fool. It's spiritual, man. Those people that were really spiritual, people that were, were, were upright, uh, Israel looked at them as being insane like they they consider them to be mad a madman you trying to tell me about what's right i look at you something being wrong you a threat to my livelihood israel looked at the prophet as being a, a threat being a fool you sitting over here preaching you know doomsday ain't nothing happened ain't nothing happened why you keep preaching doom doom and gloom and ain't nothing happened well, Scripture says the day of visitation has come. The very people that didn't take seriously the prophet, that didn't take seriously the spiritual man. You've got examples in society of how you should be and how you should conduct yourself. And even if you choose not to hear the prophet, you should still see the person that is trying to be upright. And yet you turn your back against them. And not only do you turn your back against them, but you mock those that are spiritual. Those that are trying to be holy. You try to dox them. Hmm? Make it hard for them. People that are, 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 are prophets. You do what you can to legislate them out of society. And the day of visitation has come. Look at what this says. it says. And for the multitude of thine iniquity and the great hatred. They were speaking and trying to warn you against your ways and, and to warn you about what was to come. And you hated them and all the iniquity of you which abound. The watchman of Ephraim was with my God. But the prophet, the prophet is a snare of the fowler and all of his ways and hatred is in the house of his God. The, the prophet was the actual watchman, but you did what you could to discredit anything that they had to say. And now look at you. The day of the visitation has come. They have deeply corrupted themselves as in the days of Gabeah. Therefore will he remember their iniquity and he will visit their sins. Now, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what happened in Gabeah that God is referencing through his prophet Hosea. I'll tell you a little bit about it, and then we'll go read some more about it. 
there was a, a Levite who had a concubine, and the concubine ran off. The Levite uh, saw that she was missing and went to go bring her back to himself. The Levite ended up, ended up coming into her town and, and knew where to look for her, found her at her dad's house. And the Levite went to claim his concubine back. And the dad implored the Levite to stay there. So every time the Levite wanted to leave, the dad hurt the, the, the woman's dad, his concubine's uh, dad, or in this case, the Levite's father-in-law, implored him to stay. So each day for five days, the Levite would leave, would want to leave, but the dad would implore him to stay. Finally, the Levite was like, no, I got to go. So he, he ended up taking his concubine and they were headed back home. They come up against a town and within that town, they knew that it was foreign to Israel. And they, they were like, nah, we better not go in that direction because that's a foreign land and they may not be customary to us. They may treat us wrong. Let's go in this direction because this is the land of Israel and our brothers and sisters are there. So we'll find lodging there on our way back home. Remember, they went, the whole purpose of this trip was to retrieve the concubine that left in the first place. Okay? So now, having that backdrop of the story, let's go and see what God is talking about. Let's reread verse 9. And then let's let's go and, and read for ourselves in verse nine of ch uh, in, in verse nine of chapter nine in Hosea. Uh, the Lord says they have deeply corrupted themselves as in the days of Gabeah. So let's see what God is referencing here. Go with me to Judges chapter 19 verses 10 through 30. Judges chapter 19 verses 10 through 30. Verses 10 through 30. Look at what this says here. Now you have that backdrop. Remember, they were going to go into, um, as they were trying to make their way back home from retrieving the concubine that, that took off, uh, on their way back home after having retrieved her, they were going to go into a foreign territory or foreign land, but they decided not to go that route because they know that it was strangers or a foreign land and it wouldn't be customary. So therefore, they decided to go in a direction that that wasn't foreign to Israel, that, you know, their kindred would be there or th their nationality was there. OK, so let's pick this up at verse 10, Judges 19, beginning at verse 10. The man, but the man would not tarry that night, but he rose up and he departed and he came against Jabus, which is in Jerusalem. And there were with him two asses saddled. His concubine also was with him. And when they were by, the, when they were by Jabus, the day was far spent. And the servant said to his master, come, I pray thee, let's go into this city of the Jebusites and lodge in it. His master said unto him, we will not turn aside hither into the city of strangers or into the foreign city that is not of the children of Israel. We will pass over to Gabeah, which is which is of the children of Israel. So verse 13, he said unto his servant, come, let us draw near to one of these places to lodge all night in Gabeah or in Ramah. And they passed on and they went their way. And the sun went down upon upon them when they were by Gabeah, which belonged to Benjamin. So you know it was a province of the children of Israel. And they turned aside thither to go in and to lodge in Gabeah. And when he went in, he sat down in the street of the city, for there was no man that looked them into his house that, I'm sorry, there was no man that took them into his house to lodging. So even though they were in the, in, in, in the town of their own people, they had no place to stay because no one had invited them in. Okay? They, remember, they forsook the, the towns of the Gentiles because they were like, nah, they, you know, they don't share our custom and, and our values, so we're not going to go that direction. We'll take our chances with our own people. 
okay? And when they went to their own people into Gabeah, nobody took them in, okay? Verse 16, Behold, there came an old man from his work out of the field at evening, which was also of Mount Ephraim. And he sojourned in Gabeah. But the men of the place were Benjamites. And when he had lifted up his eyes, he saw a wayfaring man in the street of the city. And the old man said, Whither goest thou? And whence comest thou? And he said unto him, We are passing from Bethlehem, uh, Judah, toward the side of the Mount Ephraim. From thence am I. And I went to Bethlehem, Judah, but am now going to the house of the, of the Lord. And there is no man that receiveth me to the house. Yet there is both straw and provender for our asses, and there is bread and wine also for me, and for my and for thine handmaid, and for the young man which is thine servant, and there is want there is no want of anything. The old man said, Peace be with thee, however, let all thy want lie upon me, only lodge not in the street. So the, there was a man that didn't even belong to the city, but yet he had a place, and he was like, where are you coming from? I'm seeing you here in the street. And the guy was like, oh, I have me and my handmaid and, and, and my servants, and uh, we're on our way from point A to point B, but, you know, no one is taking us in. We have plenty of stuff for ourselves, plenty of resources. We just don't have a place to sleep. So the old man was like, look, why don't you come with me and don't worry about anything. I can, I'll give you those things that you need. I know you have enough, but I'll still cover you with, it, with, with all that I have. I just don't want to sleep, see you sleeping out here. So uh, verse 21, so he brought him into his house and he gave him provender unto the asses and they washed their feet and they did eat and drink. Now, as they were making their hearts merry, behold, the men of the city, this is of the city of Gabeah. Certain sons of Belial, so you know they were up to no good, beset the house round about. They surrounded the house, and they beat at the door, and they spake to the master of the house, which was the old man. And they were saying, Bring forth the man that came into thine house, that we may know him. So in the city of Gabeah, <coughs> in, the in the town of Gabeah, men surrounded the house, and they wanted, they wanted the old man to bring out the stranger, the stranger that had entered the town so that they can rape him. Okay, that's what was going on. They wanted the man to come out so that they can rape him. Now the, now the man, the master of the house, he went out unto them and said unto them, Nay, my brother, and nay, I pray you, do not so, do not so wickedly, seeing that this man is coming to my house, do not this folly. Behold, here is my daughter, a maiden, and his concubine. Them I will bring out now, and humble ye them, and do with them what seemeth good unto you. But unto this man do, do not so vile things. So the old man saying, I'll give you this man's concubine, and I'll give you my daughter. Have your way with them, but don't do such a vile thing to this man. Okay? But the men would not hearken unto him. Uh, so the men took his concubine, and they brought her forth unto them. And they knew her, and they abused her all that night until the morning. And when the day began to spring, they let her go. Then came the woman in the dawning of the day, and fell down at the door of the man's house where her Lord was till it was light. And her Lord rose up in the morning, and he opened the doors of the house, and went out to go to, to go on his way. And behold, the woman, his concubine, was falling down at the door of the house, and her hands were upon the threshold. So she was so she she was dying. And he said unto her, Up, let us be going. But none answered. The man took her up upon the ass, and the man rose up and got got him unto his place. So she actually was dead. Went so what happened, again, the men came of, the, of that town of Gabeah, they came to rape the man that they saw go into the old man's house. Um, when they shouted out, when they beat on, they surrounded the house and beat at the door, and they said, bring out that man. And so the old man of the house was like, you can have my daughter and you can have his concubine, but your intentions against this man you cannot do. 
So they end up taking the concubine and they abused her so much that once they let her go, she only had enough life and strength to make it to the doorstep. She fell and died, okay, because they, they did her so wrong. Verse 29, and when he was gone, when he was coming to the house, he took a knife and he, load, he laid hold on his concubine. And he divided her, meaning that he cut her into pieces, together with her bones into 12 pieces. And he sent it into all the coast of Israel, 12, 12 tribes, 12 coasts. Okay? And it was so that all that, it, that saw it said, there was no such deed done nor seen from that day that the children of Israel came up out of the land of Egypt, even unto this day. Consider of it, take advice. And speak your minds. And so what it's saying is the man was so distraught by what society had become that he took his concubine and cut her up into pieces and, sell, and sent 12 different body parts to the 12 tribes of Israel so that he could gain the attention of them and to let them know, look what we have become as a people for this is what has become of her after what they've done to her because of what they were trying to do to me. You see that? And so God is saying, when we go back to Hosea, God is saying in verse 9, chapter 9 and verse 9, they have deeply corrupted themselves as in the day of Gabeah. That's what God is referencing. And when you get a picture to see how bad they corrupted themselves then, God is seeing that what was then was happening there at that time and why they were worthy of his judgment, why they were worthy of his visitation. The visitation, make no mistake about it, the visitation that we're speaking about is God's wrath and his judgment descending upon them because of their lewdness. Our society has become the very thing that scriptures are warning us against. When we read that, that what we just read in Judges, and, and we're seeing what society should not evolve into. But in our modern day society, that's where things are evolving into. Child trafficking and, and people kidnapping and murdering and, and raping. And these are the things that are prevalent. We're ripe for the visitation of the Lord. And when we're talking about the visitation, we're meaning his wrath, his, his anger, you know, descending from heaven, falling upon us like an eagle soaring to its prey. Because we're supposed to be better than that. The day of visitation, and, and when people begin to try to convey this truth to society, Society mocks the prophet. They mock the spiritual leaders. They discount them and defame them so that the rest of society don't listen to what's being said. Amen? Verse 10, I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as the first ripe in the fig trees at her first time. But when they went to Baal, Baal Peor and separated themselves unto that shame and their abominations were according as they loved. God said, I remember when I first laid eyes on you, Israel. You were like, like grapes when they first blossomed, when the first ripe, the, you were like grapes in the wilderness. That first, the first ripe figs of a tree. How precious you were in my sight. I, how your forefathers were when I first saw them. But now look at the descendants, quick to run over and worship B.L. Peor. And their abominations were according to they love. And just as B.L. Peor, the abominations that's laid up on that idol, so are the abominations laid up on you. As for Ephraim, their glory shall fly away like bird, like a bird from the birth, from the womb, and from the conception. And in society now, we're dealing with, with abortion, you know, especially that in, 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 you know, Texas has come up with this law, and people are determined 
to see how to get around this law so that we can continue to abort children. But look at what this says. A lot of that may be the wrath of God that we're, that we're seeing. Look at what this says. As Ephraim, and it's talking about Israel, their glory shall fly away like birds from the birth, from the womb, and from, and from the conception. That as they don't see any value of life, God is saying, I'm going to see to it that their, that, that their, their lineage lives not on but to put an end to their multiplying, to, to, to see to it that no child grows in the womb, to see to it that no child you know, is born, to see to it that there is not even a child that's conceived in the womb. Uh, for they keep bringing forth and coming, to, coming forth in destruction. These kids are keep raising up to, 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 to go forth and, and more and more into destruction. So God is saying that I, I, just, I, I can't deal with that. Your, your nations just keep turning more and more in, into pagans. Your children now, every generation is further and further away from godliness. Amen. And I'm not here, well, trust me as I say this, I'm not here to, to, um, to, to be a, 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 an ally of abortion. I, I do what I can to see the greater good of people, but to also warn about the difficult road ahead if we choose to take a road and not walk with God. Um, I believe that God does allow for people to make decisions and choices, but the wrath of God, God is, his wrath is something else. And God is saying here that their ways are going to leave them childless. And that's his wrath that makes them childless. Our ways are leaving us childless. We're setting up abortion clinics rather than for fertility clinics. I, I heard uh, one of the, um, one of the, uh, what's those ride sharing? Um, I know that there's people that are giving, uh, people that are giving, uh, donations to to the Planned Parenthoods for, for but instead of people looking why you got you got some people that are for abortion and some people that are against it people say my body my choice but it's not like that with vaccinations but that's a whole other thing you know it, you know we're okay with the mandate of, on one thing but we're we're not okay with this but nevertheless you have organizations that are giving uh, to the Planned Parenthood to help them continue to carry these things out. And nobody is questioning why are we trying to slow down um, the, the, the heritage of men? Why are we so quick to kill babies or to, to keep them from being aborted? And we're okay with that. Why are we so quick to put it into life? And it could be because people may be under a delusion. And that delusion may represent the wrath of God. You just don't know, you know, but it's no good. We see here in the Bible that uh, because of the way Israel was, God was putting an end to some things or through his anger, Israel was putting an end to where they would lose, you know, they, they would miscarry, you know, because of, because of the way they were, that they couldn't be fruitful and multiply. It was putting an end to their lineage. We're fine. We're trying to come up with cunning ways how to keep our lineage going while others are looking for a way to put it away, you know, and nobody is looking at what's the, the actions that are causing you to, to, you know, to become pregnant, whether, you know, again, nobody is creating a fertility clinics. It's all about abortion clinics, you know, doing away with children. And, and that's no good because we see here in the scriptures that, a lot of that was associated with the wrath of God. You know, look at that verse again. As Ephraim, in verse 11, as, as for Ephraim, their glory shall fly away like a bird from the birth, from the womb, from the conception. They're not even going to be able to conceive, to bring forth kids. You know, because they're... they're their sins were putting out of way. It's a blessing to be able to produce 
a, a, a child to be able to, to, to con for there to be conception of a child. That's a blessing. And you could put yourself in harm's way that you, you'll never be able to bring forth a child. And that's no good. Though they bring up their children, yet I will bereave them that they shall not be a man left. Yea, woe also to them when I depart from them. God is saying that, that the time will come to where your sins are so that you'll find yourself a, an example. You'll find yourself at war and your men have to be drafted. And before you know it, all of your sons are dead in a war and there's, no, there's not a man left of you. Because they're all, they're all dead because of, of sin and the ambitions of men, you know, how greed, how, how greed befalls men. And you find yourself in wars and, and things that you have no business into because you're following after leaders that want to take over the world. And, and they, they draft your sons so that they can be on the front line. Now I just read recently that they, that now women can be drafted just as men. You just want to kill off humanity altogether. You know, and this is no good. Verse 13, Ephraim, as I saw Tyre, that word Tyrus is actually Tyre. Tyre was a pleasant, beautiful, prosperous place. So God is saying, Ephraim, as I saw Tyre, as Tyre was blessed to be prosperous, is planted in a pleasant place. But Ephraim shall bring forth his children to the murderer. So that's the, just like Tyre was a beautiful place and God saw that Ephraim was planted in the same way that it was planted to be prosperous. But because they turned their back on God, he's going to turn his back on, on their descendants and their longevity to where they won't be able to conceive or their children, not that they wouldn't conceive, that's not what it says, but that their kids will be murdered. And I gave you an example of that through war and and, and, and through plagues and everything else, it's no good, right? Give them, O Lord, what will, what, give them, O Lord, what will thou give? Give them a miscarrying womb and dry breast. Look at that. All of their, and, and you have to look to see when abortions are prevalent in the land, when people are miscarrying constantly, Sometime you have to see uh, if, if the Lord is behind some things. And I'm just, I'm reading scripture here and I'm looking at this because I live according to scripture. My beliefs align with scripture. Now I'm not saying that every woman that miscarries, that, that I've miscarried lived in sin. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that there are those times that the miscarriage had to do with the wrath of God according to scripture. Not all the time, but some of the time. That's what I'm saying. But we're starting to see that, ab that abortions has nothing to do with righteousness. It's an unrighteous thing that we would, you know, give our, that we would give our kids to be slaughtered. Everything that we're reading about, <laughs> about ending a kid's life had to do with sin. So as we relate that to abortion, all of that has to do with sin. The, the, the sanctity of life and the preservation of life, we don't, it, that's not part of God's wrath. The sanctity of life and the, and, and, and the preserving of life is about the blessing of God. But the ending of life and, 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 and the abortion of life is all about the judgment of God. It's all wrapped up in sin. Nothing, it, nothing prosperous comes from that. Everything that we're reading about it's no good. Give them, O Lord, what, what, give them, O Lord, what will thou give them? Give them a miscarrying womb and dry breast, meaning that they can't bring forth milk out to feed the child, right? All of their wickedness is in Gilgal. That's where, that's where it all starts with them, you know. Um, in Gilgal, that's where it was concentrated at, this sin. It says, for there I hated them. For the wickedness of their doing, I will drive them out of mine house. I will love them no more. All of their princes are revolters. Ephraim is smitten. Their root is dried up. They shall bear no fruit. Yea, they shall bring no fruit. They shall bring forth. Though they, I'm sorry. Ephraim is smitten. 
their root is dried up. They shall bear no fruit. Yea, though they bring forth, yea, I'll, yet I will slay them, even the beloved fruit of their womb. My God will cast them away because they did not hearken unto him. And they shall be wanderers among the nations. So when you can't even be fruitful and multiply, there are women that desire such to be moms, to, to have children, and, and, and the only thing that they can do is adopt because some ailment of another. And, and some women, when we read, um, when we read with uh, uh, Elkanah and his wife Hannah, um, and I believe that was Samuel's, Samuel's parents, but at the time, uh, Hannah couldn't have kids, and she was embarrassed because uh, Elkanah's other wife was able to have children. And they kind of put that in the face of, 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 the, of the wife that was childless, uh, that, that couldn't bear. And so, and that's another testament to where it's not always sin that causes you to, to not be able to bring forth children. But nevertheless, uh, she went to, to uh, Eli. She went to the temple and she was praying to God constantly that God would give her a child. And uh, Eli heard her prayer and he, and he commented on it. Amen. He thought she was drunk at first. But my whole point in bringing that up is there is times that women feel some kind of way, especially when so many other people are able to have children and they themselves are not. And how they feel towards that. And we at will just give up a child and just, you know, that's just no good. And like I said, a lot of that is associated with sin. As a nation, we have, that's not the only sin. Abortion is not the only sin. As a nation, we have to turn, we have to reverse course and start moving back to the Lord. But the further away, the further away we move from God, the more we're under delusion. The further away we move away from God, the more he turns us over to ourselves. And when... When he turns us over to ourselves, we're our own worst enemy because there is no more reasoning with us. There is no more um, appealing to us. Once we become reprobate, all of those things that, that we were warned against, uh, we, we, we specialize in the practice of those things, the practice of sin. As a matter of fact, those things lead to our death. Because there is no longer any barriers of morality set up to keep us or to slow us down from heading into destruction. Amen. So the worst thing we can be, the worst thing that can happen is that God turns us over to ourselves, which puts us in the mind frame of being reprobate, meaning doing things, uh, being engaged in unrighteousness without, without barriers, uh, you know, being without a conscience, amen? So, and, and, and under that, you're full speed ahead towards destruction, amen? So eternal God, I thank you for this word. I thank you for the opportunity to preach, to teach, to declare. Father, I pray that you are glorified and I pray as a nation that there is enough that have heard this word, that have heard it or will hear it, and that their hearts would become softened and that they would look upon their ways, even as I look upon mine own ways, to see what's out of the line with you and to look to repent and to come back to you. Father, thank you that you would convict us in our heart that we would turn from our evil ways and return unto you, even to have the desire to be upright before you. Father, we pray for those who have not yet that desire to turn towards you. For we hold out hope that just as far away as we were from you and you were able to bring us close to you, that you're no respecter of persons and that you can do that to those that are just as far away. I thank you, Father, for that lively hope. I thank you for restoration and repentance that bring us into grace and mercy and salvation. God, thank you. Thank you for long-suffering. 
Thank you for your grace and your mercy and your words of truth. Seeing what was to become of, seeing what happened to society then and what can happen to our society today. Father, your words and your truth is enduring and everlasting. To God be the glory forever and ever. It's in Jesus' name that we give you thanks. Amen. I know I'm a little long in this broadcast. If you would quickly go with me to Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. So the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, is inviting us to be sons and daughters of God. In order to do this, we have to go through him. God placed uh, authority within the Lord Jesus Christ. That the only way we can access the Father is to embrace the Son. And don't take my word for it. Hold your place there and let's read that. Go with me to the Gospel of John. And I believe it's in, is it here in, yeah, here in chapter 14. The Gospel of John chapter 14. Uh, and here's what it says, beginning at verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. This is Jesus talking. He says, in my Father's house are many rooms or many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you into myself, unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And whether I go, you know, and the way, you know. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest. How can we know the way? Jesus says here in verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's why Jesus is able to offer us an opportunity to become sons and daughters. We can't have the Father unless we have the Son. No man can come unto the Father except they come by way of the Lord Jesus Christ. God has placed that authority into Jesus. Our salvation is through. God offers, our, offers us the gift of salvation, but it's received through Jesus Christ. Amen? Now, Matthew 11, verse 28. Jesus says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. All of you that have been working and you're weary and you're worn out, I'm here to offer you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. I am meek and lowly in heart and you, you will find rest unto your souls. My yoke is easy. He says, well, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus is offering us an opportunity to become sons and daughters of the Most High God. But we have to learn of him who he is, why he's offering, and what it is that he's offering. We know what he's offering. We'll see that here in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 12. The Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 12. We get an opportunity to, to He details what it is that we're all, not only is he offering us rest, but an opportunity to, to become sons and daughters of the Most High God. We see that here in the Gospel of John chapter 12, uh, the Gospel of John chapter 1, I should say, chapter 1 verse 12, chapter 1 verse 12. But as many as he received, to them gave he power or authority to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name. So the sons or the children, a better way, the children of God, those of us that receive Jesus as Lord, he makes us to become the children of God. Amen? So not only is he offering you rest, but he's offering you a place in the family. And now, that means you have to turn away from your sins. What we were reading about is how Israel didn't until it was too late. Remember, Israel was like, God, we know you. But that was only after his wrath fell on them. The time to, to call upon the Lord is now before his wrath falls on us. 
Because once that happens, it'll be too late. Now is the time to call upon the Lord before his wrath. We cannot keep going in the direction we're going and think that the day of his visitation won't come. We're hoping that we don't see it in our lifetime, that somebody else sees it in their lifetime, but not us. let us continue to do what we want to do when we want to do it in the capacity in which we want to get it done. And we're hoping that we're not visited by him in the process of our rebellion. Now is the time to separate yourselves from those that are rebellious against the Lord. You don't want to be counted amongst them. We have to turn away from our sins once and for all. That means we have to stop doing it. Quit coming up with the excuse. Just stop doing it once and for all. And turn to the Lord our God and call upon Jesus to save you from your sins. So first and foremost, as we come to Jesus, we stop sinning. And you can't say it's too hard. You say it's easier to sin. Whatever is worth having is worth fighting for. And you got to put in the time and the work to obtain it. And if you hang in there, you're going to turn away from your sins once and for all. But you got to put the work in. Stop going around those people that are promoting that sin that you're addicted to. Stop accessing it through the very means and channels in which you access it. You got to do what you can to turn away from that stuff. You can't make provisions for that stuff to prevail in your life and then try to turn away from it. You have to do what you can to make provisions to turn away from it. That means whatever avenues the enemy used to tempt you, you have to cut it off. Whether it's TV, whether it's the phone, whether it's the internet, whether it's people, places, or things, whatever it is, cut those avenues out so that you can turn away from the sins once and for all. Amen? Now, you repented of your sins. You turned away from it once and for all. So now you have to believe that Jesus is the Christ and make him Lord of your life. Go with me to Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 13. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 13. Because our salvation comes through Jesus Christ, we have to commit to obey him. We have to make him Lord of our lives, meaning that we obey him. He is now the governor of our lives. He is now our head. He is our head. Amen. And we have to commit to obey him. We believe that he is the only begotten son of God who was raised from the dead, meaning that he laid down his life for us so that our sins would die with him. And as God brought him back to life and resurrected him, so is our salvation in him through our faith. Amen. So we believe that. Amen. So we, we not only believe, but we confess him to be Lord of our lives after we have repented of our sins. So Romans chapter 10, beginning at verse 9. With the, with the, with it, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, meaning that we make him the head of our lives, he is governor of our lives, he is the Lord of our lives, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. What are you being saved from? Remember we talked about the day of the visitation has come. Go with me to the Gospel of John chapter 3 verse 36. The Gospel of John chapter 3 verse 36. Look at what this says. He that believeth on the Son has everlasting life. He that, hath, he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. The day of God's visitation shall come upon those who have not received Jesus as Lord. Amen. So if you believe in the son, then you make him Lord of your life. That means you believe he's the only begotten son of God and that he laid down his life for you. So shall you lay down your life for him because he laid down his life for you. You make him Lord of your life. Amen. And then you believe that God has raised him from the dead, meaning that he died for our behalf. God brought him back to life and he is alive forevermore. If you believe it and you commit to him, he saves you. What are you being saved from? The visitation of God, which is in the form of his wrath. 
Amen. For, uh, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Scripture says that if you take a chance on God in, by faith through Jesus Christ, he won't let you down. There is a process there because you got to get used to, to abiding in faith. And, and your, your flesh is full of fear. It's going to try to talk you out of putting your trust in God. But you got to hang in there. And if you continue to hang in there, you'll start to, what you're doing is you're sowing seed of faith. And you're going to see a harvest come forth. But you have to work it. You have to keep working it. And you're going to see it pay dividends for you. Amen? For there is no difference. This is not only to the Jews, but it's also to the Gentiles. There is no difference between the Jews and the Greek, which are the Gentiles. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. So that means you have to be the one to call upon. God has salvation waiting for you right now, but you have to come get it. And how do you come get it? You have to come through Jesus Christ to obtain that gift of salvation. So for whosoever, verse 13, shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's that gift of salvation. Go with me quickly. We're moving quickly through, through this. Go with me quickly to 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 through 10. 1 John, not the gospel of, of, of John, but 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. Look at what this says here. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. We have to be honest with what's going on with us. What, wherever you're broke at, you have to be willing to confess how broke about yourself that you are. I'm not just talking about financially. I'm talking about characteristics, morality, whatever your shortcomings are, you have to repent from that. And then you let God know what it is that you repented of. The reason why is because we're, we're going to have to meet him in the day of judgment. And we don't want God to bring up anything that, that, that we haven't put away. So we have to let God know what it is that we turned away from. And then God removes it from our record. He wipes our record clear of it once and for all. Amen. But if you don't confess it, it remains on your record and it's subject to be brought up when you visit God in the day of judgment. Amen. So if you if you repent and you confess, God is faithful to forgive and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But if you say that you haven't sinned, then you're making then you're a liar because everybody sinned and there is nothing that God can do to help you if you won't acknowledge what's broken about you. So, amen. You have to take responsibility. Lastly and quickly, go with me to Acts chapter two, verses uh, 36 through 47. God is going to give you his Holy Spirit. When you be commit to walking with God, the Spirit of God is going to fall upon you and come inside of you. And once His Spirit comes inside of you, it's going to help transform you from on the inside out so that you can obtain all the gifts of God that the kingdom has to offer. Okay, and it's a process. But that's what God does to you when you begin to commit to Him and you begin to walk with Him through His only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when God sent the Spirit, it started with the disciples. After Jesus ascended into heaven, uh, not too long after his ascension, the, the, the uh, Holy Ghost fell upon the disciples. So that was the start of us receiving the presence and the power of God abiding in us. After the disciples received it, Peter began to preach to his audience because this happened. This, the first movement of the Holy Ghost happened on this a solemn day of Pentecost, one particular day, and, and it fell upon the disciples. After that happened, Peter began to preach to his audience, and here's what Peter said, beginning at verse 36. 
Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God had made that same Jesus whom you've crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, Peter is not saying that you actually drove the nails through Christ Jesus. What he's saying is your lifestyle make you just as guilty as those that did crucify Jesus on a cross. That applies to us too. If we're living in open rebellion, if we're committing blatant sin, if we're committing sin, period, and living in, in an open shame against God, we're no different than those that crucified Jesus to the cross. We want to turn away from our sins so that we're not chargeable as those that had, that had crucified Jesus on the cross. Amen? Because we know by faith Jesus is Lord. And he is the Messiah, the anointed one from God. Now, when his audience, in verse 37, when, when, when they heard this, they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, we're talking about Peter's audience. When they heard Peter's sermon, they said, men and brethren, what must we do? In essence, what can we do to right our wrongs? When God begins to convict you in your heart, he's trying to move you to repentance. Not to just to get you to say, amen, boy, that boy preached. And then go back to doing those things that, that keeps your house out of order with God. He wants to get your house in order. When God convicts you, it's his love towards you to let you know that you're on the wrong path. And I need your heart to line up with the righteousness of Jesus Christ so that judgment don't visit you. Amen. And so... When, when, when their heart was convicted, Peter's audience, they wanted to know what could they do. Peter tells them in verse 38, he says, repent. We've talked about repentance, turning away from your sins once and for all. Then Peter says, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Now, let's talk about the ceremony of baptism. Jesus died on the cross. And he was taken down off the cross and then he was carried to a tomb and he was laid to rest in a tomb. In that tomb, he was laid to rest for three days and three nights. And then after three days and three nights, he was brought back to life. So he was in the he was dead on the cross, taken down off the cross, laid to rest in the tomb, was dead for three days and three nights. And God brought him back to life. When we go through the ceremony of baptism, when you go down into the water, you are being buried in Christ Jesus. That's why we are fully submerged in baptism. When we come up out of the water, uh, we are resurrected in Christ Jesus. So your, your old man goes down into the water, fully submerged. Your new man comes up out of the water and all things are made new. You're cleansed of all of your sins. Amen. That's why it's important to get back to get go through the ceremony of baptism. Again, your old man goes down in the water, your new man comes up out of the water, all of your sins are washed away. And eventually you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In this day of uh of uh in our day and time of 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 COVID-19 uh, uh, the, the coronavirus, people don't, people are leery about close contact uh, with others, so much so that we're forsaking our obligations with God uh, to honor the ceremony of baptism. It's no good. It's no good. We can't allow that to be taken away from us. So if I were you, I will ask God to show me or to, to send someone to me that are, that's willing to perform the ceremony or, or to send me to someone that's willing to perform the ceremony. There are people that are out there that are willing to do it. Amen. So uh, I ask God to do that for you, but don't do not forsake uh, your obligation to, to have the ceremony performed. God has not taken excuses. You know, well, Lord, I, I, you know, the corona, 
The only thing that will fly is if you are already on your deathbed. I, and the reason why I say that is because there were people on the cross. Remember the two malefactors that were on the cross? There was no way that they could be baptized. But one of them confessed Jesus as Lord. He believed he was, he was I actually would, 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 would read the story with you real quick. Uh, look at this. Look at this. Go with me real quick to Luke chapter 23. Drop down to verse 39. Drop down to verse 39. And look at what this says. And one of the malefactors which was hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Doest not thou fear God, seeing that thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, he acknowledged Jesus as being the only, be he, he acknowledged him as being Lord. He committed to him. Look, he acknowledged him as being Lord. He said unto, he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thine kingdom. He acknowledged Jesus as being that Lord in Christ. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. So that's the only thing that I have read in scripture that will allow you to forsake this this uh, 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 this the ceremony of baptism is when you're on your deathbed and you cannot have it performed or you know uh, other than when there is something that actually incapacitates you that's the only thing that I've read that you know that it that the ceremony could be forsaken but when it's incumbent upon you to do it, you can't tell God, Lord, because of the coronavirus, I just, you know, you understand, Lord. You, you, you know. You can't be like that. It's, it's, you know, ask God to send you to someone or to send someone to you so that the ceremony can be performed. Amen? So now, Peter tells them, repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. We've talked about that. You're going to receive the gift from God for the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord God shall call. So God is not only in the business of saving you, but saving your children, your children's children. All of those that 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 are born, he wants to offer them the gift of salvation with many other words that he testify and exhort. He encouraged them saying, save yourselves from this lawless or godless generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So God was adding to the size of our family. Now those of you that are starting out in this walk, in this race, don't take your foot off the gas. Continue to move forward, always move forward. Don't slow down and stop because once that happens, you become in danger of being idle. And then and when you're in danger of being idle, you're in danger of backsliding and falling away. Look at what this verse says in, in, you know, in respect to that. Verse 42, they continued steadfastly. They were faithful about their continuation of things in the apostles' doctrine. So they never stopped taking in that word. They never stopped fellowshipping. They always came together breaking bread and they stayed in prayers. They continue to move forth in those things. God has got you to a good place in life. Always continue to move forward. Fear came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. That's one thing that begins to happen immediately. You begin to be concerned about how God feels concerning, how God feels about you or about what you're doing. You're mindful of him. And that's that reverence you have for him. And you know that he don't play. That's that healthy fear. And all that believed were together and had all things common. They sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. God fills you with contentment to where you don't find yourself. It's hard to let go of things anymore. God begins to have you content. And you become, he starts to make you into a generous person that you're, mindful of other people's needs right they sold their possessions and good they parted them verse 46 and they continuing daily with one accord in the temple they were breaking bread from house to house and they did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart they were praising god and having favor with all people 
the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. God, I thank you for the opportunity to bring forth your word. Even more, I thank you for the opportunity to be saved from the gift that you brought forth, which is salvation. And you administer it unto us even through Jesus Christ, who is our Lord, your only begotten son. Father, you have long suffered and you have chosen us to be the children of the most high God. Now, those, of, those that have accepted your gift, those whom you've called out of darkness, I thank you for saving them. Now I ask you to equip them, to strengthen them, to raise them up as children who fear God, who will endure unto the end, children of courage, children of great gifts and blessings, great talents, O oh God, used to glorify God and to draw others out of the world into the light of Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for the, that the size of our family. Thank you for allowing those to be saved where they can edify our brothers and our sisters and when we can all come together in fellowship and worship God to be in praise of you. Father, help us to glorify you with the gifts that you've called us with. Father, continue to call on others to be saved. Use us according to your will and according to your pleasures that we may join you in paradise with your only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you again for adding to the size of our family and continuing to call all of us out of darkness. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, Father, we also ask that you would send them to places of worship to where they can be baptized. And send people to them, those who, whom you've called out of darkness, where they can be baptized, whether they go or someone is being sent, to facilitate the, the ceremony, Father, for your will and for your blessing and for our obligations to you. I ask of you this in Jesus' name. Amen. Folks, I thank you for allowing my family and I to be a part of your Bible study. Thank you for hanging in there with us, as always. Um, our benediction uh, comes from Numbers, uh, chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. Uh, please always uh, make sure you have uh, repented of all of your sins so that you are able to be a recipient of the blessings that's being bestowed upon you. Again, Numbers, chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. The Lord bless thee and keep thee, for this is being loosed upon you, and I want you to receive it. Again, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. I loose this unto you that you would prosper, that you would be well and in good health that God will lead, continue to lead and guide you and that you would acknowledge him in all parts of your life and in all of your ways, that you would acknowledge him, the sovereign king of the universe, even the Lord Jesus Christ, the prince of all the kings upon the earth, that you would acknowledge him and that God continues to acknowledge you. I loose it on you that you would prosper in your walk with him. Receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, my brothers and sisters. Again, thank you for allowing my family and I to be a part of your Bible study. Amen.